my channel so today I'm gonna be doing questions with you guys about neurocutaneous syndromes because a lot of these may have common features and may be confusing so I'm gonna show you how exactly to do them and pick the features from the question and uh, show you some pictures as well uh, so let's get started all right guys so the question says like i always tell you i read the last two lines so the last two lines say the slit lamp exam shows pigmented iris nodules examination of his skin shows eight brownish macules and numerous soft non-tender pedunculated lesions on the back chest and abdomen which of the following is the most appropriate next step in management Obviously, by just reading those two lines, I've already come to the diagnosis that this patient has neurofibromatosis type 1. The pigmented iris nodules actually are Lish nodules, and the pedunculated lesions are neurofibromas, right? So once you see these features, you know this patient probably has NF1, and so your next step means I want to figure out the other features of the disease. So my next step in management should be figuring out whether there is similar neurofibromas in his brain, like elsewhere, etc. Uh, so I already have like the the diagnosis in mind. I already have the next step in mind. But I want you guys to like to reinforce this with you so i'm still gonna read the whole question is a six-year-old boy uh, which also confirms that this is inherited uh his father knows he has several pigmented areas on his skin a few fleshy bumps which we've confirmed here he also had some blurred vision his left eye and uh, his father has similar skin findings which also confirms because this is autosomal dominant his mother has epilepsy and glaucoma Again, maybe because of uh, the seizures coming from the tumors in her brain. Visual acuity testing shows 2050 in the left eye because he has blurred vision in his left eye. Could be due to optic gliomas, which is another feature of the disease. So now we have so many features of the disease that we want to confirm the other ones and find out if there is lesions in his brain as well so we have to do an mri now why not a ct scan because we know that mris best detect soft tissue while ct best detects bone right here he's telling you patients nf1 are increased risk develop benign malignant nervous system tumors we have already seen uh, the macules, we've already seen the Lish nodules, the neurofibroma. So, what is next? What is remaining is the brain tumors. We want to find out whether it's found or not. Also, because he has blurred vision in the left eye, we he could possibly have optic glioma, which you also want to confirm with MRI. Here, for example, is the optic glioma. Next. All right, guys, whenever you see a question with a picture, always open the picture first because usually this will give away the diagnosis. So without um, applying the overlay, I'm going to show you guys that here, for example, in this area, you have capillaries, capillaries, capillaries. So this is a vascular tumor, right? And here, those empty areas represent fat cells. So this tumor is probably a vascular tumor, right? So let's see. Um, reading the last two lines, an MRI of the brain shows an infratentorial mass and the patient undergoes surgical resection of the mass, which is shown here in this picture. What is the most likely diagnosis? So right now I know this patient has a vascular mass, a vascular tumor, but I don't know exactly what's going on. So I'm going to read from the beginning. 22-year-old man comes because of headaches and blurry vision for the past six months. So it could be a mass in his brain. He also reports frequent episodes of vomiting. All these are signs of increased intracranial tension. His father died of renal cell carcinoma at the age of 37. Now, this is not a typical age for renal cell carcinoma unless it's part of an inherited syndrome. So let's think together about which syndrome increases the risk of renal cell carcinoma at such a young age. As you can see, his father, so it is probably one of those neurocutaneous syndromes, right? Which could be, very possibly be, von Hippel-Lindau. 
but I'm going to continue. Examination shows 2040 40 vision bilaterally uh, because he could have the same lesions in his retina. Fundoscopic exam shows bilateral optic disc swelling. This is papilledema indicating increased intracranial tension. So the signs of increased intracranial tension here include headache, blurry vision because of papilledema, and vomiting. A uh, fundoscopic exam also shows growth of capillary vessels in the temporal peripheral retina. So this could be another cause of his blurred vision. And so we found these masses in his retina. And he has a family history of renal cell carcinoma at a young age. So hemangios, hemangiomas and renal cell carcinoma are part of the von Hippel-Lindau disease, right? So he's asking you what's the diagnosis according to the picture. So what is this tumor? Obviously, it's a hemangioblastoma. So you could have solved the question very easily just by looking at the picture. I just wanted to continue with you guys the question so you can figure out the disease, which is part of the neurocutaneous syndrome. Right? The key here in the picture is to recognize those capillaries, which will always let, uh, tell you that this is a vascular tumor. And the only vascular tumor here is a hemangioblastoma. All right? Next, uh, again, let's read the last two lines. He speaks in bisyllables. It's a vocabulary of almost 50 words. And if I go back, I'm going to see it's a three-year-old boy. This is obviously delayed. Examination shows a large purple-colored patch over the left cheek. One week later, he dies, which the is the most likely finding on autopsy. So here we have a three-year-old boy with a delayed milestone and a large purple-colored patch over the left cheek. Uh, let's read from the beginning. A three-year-old boy is brought to the ER after losing consciousness. His parents report he collapsed and had repetitive twitching movements the right side of his body that lasted approximately one minute. As you can see here, this is a one-minute seizure, which is very fatal. He recently started to walk with support. It's to imagine that he only recently started walking and with support at age three. This should have been earlier. It should have been at least one year or even earlier than that. Right? Uh, so he has delayed milestones. He has seizures on the right side of his body and a poor wine stain on the left side. You can see here that this is consistent with uh, Sturge Weber syndrome, which usually shows uh, um, usually shows a hemangioma or like a vascular malformation on one side of the brain and a port wine stain on the other side. So this is very characteristic, and obviously he's gonna have delayed milestones. Uh, so what is the most likely finding on autopsy? He wants you to figure out other features of the disease once you reached the diagnosis he wants to to be sure to, to make sure that you actually reach the right diagnosis uh, so the other findings that that is specific to uh, sturge weber syndrome will be uh, vascular tumor or vascular malformation in the brain uh, just like the vascular malformation on the skin which is the port wine stain uh, so this is a leptomeningeal vascular malformation Again, the whole problem here is with the capillaries. And so you get skin lesions related to this, uh, to vessels, and you also get uh, vascular malformations in the brain. So vascular malformation in the skin is the port wine stain. Vascular malformation in the brain is the leptomeningeal one that you can find on MRI or autopsy or whatever. Okay, next. <sighs> All right, uh, let's read the last two lines. An MRI of the brain shows a three centimeter mass near the right internal auditory meatus and a two centimeter mass at the left cerebellopontine angle. The abnormal cells in these masses are most likely derived from which the fungal embryological structures. Right now, guys, I'm 100% sure of the diagnosis because we have bilateral tumors at the at, in these locations, cerebellopontine angle or internal auditory meatus, almost the same location affecting the uh, vestibular cochlear nerve. If you have bilateral schwannomas, that is sh like almost a giveaway for NF2, neurofibromatosis 2, because a sporadic schwannoma will be unilateral. But if it's bilateral, then this is NF2. 
Now, regardless whether it's NF1 or NF, uh, I mean, regardless whether it's NF2 or sporadic, it's a schwannoma. What is the origin, what is the embryological origin of schwannomas is what this question wants you to know. So, essentially, you don't have to figure out if it's NF2, but what you have to figure out is that this is a tumor of Schwann cells, and so where do Schwann cells come from embryologically, and we all know it's from the neural crest, right? Now, in order to probably confirm, read further for your, like, for the sake of reading, we we can make sure here that this is NF2 um, because in addition to the signs of uh, bilateral schwannomas, decreased hearing, dizziness, and ringing, etc., he also has um, cafe au lait patches, multiple soft yellow plaques and papules on his arms, chest, and back, right? So this is something to let us know that this is a neurocutaneous disorder because had it been a normal person who just had a sporadic schwannoma he wouldn't show skin lesions but this is part of neurocutaneous disorders right